Hi, I'm Chris Kanish, and this is CS44, Secure Web App Development. Today, we're gonna to be talking about getting started with JavaScript as a computer science major. So first, as a little context, this class is intended to be for juniors and seniors at, that are taking a computer science major, as well as graduate students that wanna get an introduction to web development. The really important thing here is that I assume that you already know how to program. I assume that you've probably learned C++ or Java or Python and understand imperative programming. This talk isn't intended to give you all the information. It's intended to be a really quick overview of specific features that are unique or quirky within JavaScript that we will be using throughout our careers when we are actually using JavaScript. So let's get started. JavaScript is dynamically typed, very similar to Python. So if we just take this example, if I say let variable equal 42, and I say type of variable, it will tell me that that is a number. And if I just take variable and I say now it's a string, and I do type of variable again, it tells me it's a string. While this allows JavaScript to be very flexible, inevitably it also leads to bugs. Another big thing you might not be familiar with is that functions are first class citizen. Functions can be declared as variables, just like any other variable. They can be passed as arguments, and that's something you're gonna see very, very often. The arrow function syntax is a little bit confusing the first time you see it. It's not very similar to what you see in a lot of other languages. In most cases, as we're getting started with JavaScript, you can consider a function declaration of the traditional style, equivalent to a function declaration using this arrow style. Once you get a little bit more advanced, there are a lot of differences, but usually we're not gonna to be touching those early on in our JavaScript journey. One other thing that absolutely sticks out about JavaScript is its use of var variables that are function scoped. One nice thing about modern JavaScript is that not only do we still have the function scoped var declaration for variables, we also have let and const, which allow you to block scope variables. Let's do a quick example about what's weird about function scoping of variables. I'm gonna put this in here. Uh, I'm gonna save this code. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna have the node interpreter run it. So I'm gonna run test.js and it's gonna give me undefined. Right, so that kind of makes sense. I've got a var, it has been declared to five and we haven't declared it yet, so we get that undefined. Now, one could imagine that, okay, it printed out undefined, no big deal. What happens if I comment this out? Am I gonna get the same exact thing? No, I absolutely do not. I'm getting a fact that A is not defined at all here and that's very different from A is defined, it just hasn't been assigned yet. So the core thing here is that when you declare a variable with the var keyword, that declaration gets hoisted to the top of whatever function scope you're in. We're in the global scope here. So what this is actually equivalent to is saying var a up here and then saying a equals five down here. That is the same thing as this. If we change this up a little bit, instead we say let a equals five and I come down here and I run it, I'm gonna get that same problem because here A is block scoped. That declaration of A only exists within the enclosing block that it was declared in. The this keyword is another absolutely tricky thing about JavaScript. One nice thing about this is that in a lot of modern JavaScript, the use of classes and polymorphism and all of that is not very common. So you don't necessarily see the use of the this keyword very much in modern JavaScript. You do see it occasionally. It's somewhat similar to self in Python where you can not only pass it in in Python, you can also redefine which object you are calling those functions on. So it's very similar to that. And there are bind, apply, call, these other utility functions that allow you to call a function with a different context if you so choose. So I'm not gonna go into too many of these details because we're not gonna need them too often, but especially if you're gonna do like a tech interview where you say, I know JavaScript, they're gonna hit you with, oh, how does call work? How does bind work? How would you do this in this context, right? It gets really, really confusing really, really fast. Another really fun thing about JavaScript is how it handles true and false variables. When you're using a variable in a context in which you need it to evaluate to either true or false, like in an if statement, JavaScript is going to coerce that variable to a true or false statement. So in this example, you can see that the empty string gets coerced to a false value and the non-empty string gets coerced into a true value. This feels a little bit like C 
where non-zero numbers are seen as true, zero numbers are seen as false. They're getting coerced to a binary value of true or false. Another really tricky aspect of this is using the double equals versus the triple equals in JavaScript. The basic idea is that triple equals checks for strict equality, which is usually what you want, whereas double equals will check for truthiness or falsiness. It's gonna do some coercion and then it's going to check whether that is true or not. So let's work a quick example here. We're gonna go into our node interpreter. I'm gonna say const a equals zero. I'm gonna say const b equals the empty string. And if I ask for the coerced value of is a equal to b, it's gonna tell me it's true. However, if I ask for strict equality, it's not gonna give me a true value. It's gonna give me false because those are not actually equal to each other. Now we're gonna get into some more juicier concepts about JavaScript and what is important about it. JavaScript itself runs on an event loop, whether it's in the browser or on the server in something like Node. The basic structure for executing JavaScript either in the browser or on the server is a single threaded event loop. When something happens, whether it's user input or a script getting loaded, code gets executed in a single thread of execution. And while that thread of execution is running, it might ask the runtime, hey, I want you to run this later for me for some definition of later. In the example that we're seeing right now, we're seeing set timeout is a function which is telling the JavaScript runtime, hey, while we are running right this moment, I'm gonna ask you to take this function, bottle it up, put it on your queue of things to run later, and after zero milliseconds, run it. So after that set timeout has been set, the code runs at console log by, and then after zero milliseconds, the JavaScript runtime will say, oh, hey, I have to take this pending callback. It is ready to be run now because zero milliseconds have passed and I'm going to run it. So even though we see that console.log high before the console.log buy, we see buy come out before high. This is a really important concept to wrap your head around and this example absolutely doesn't do it justice, but we'll be going over it a lot over the course of this semester. So that event loop that we were talking about is primarily there so that we can do event-driven programming. You could imagine in a graphical user interface type environment, you're going to be responding to a lot of events. You're gonna be responding to clicks. You're gonna be responding to the responses to HTTP requests. You're gonna be responding to users typing, users clicking arrow keys. Whatever it is that they're doing is going to cause an event to fire. And what you need to do in your programming is add event listeners to handle those. So we have a very, very basic idea here where we're telling the runtime that when a click event happens on the document variable, we'll see that in a second, you will run that callback function. So here we're passing a function as a first order primitive like we saw on a previous slide. That will just run a console.log function anytime you click anywhere on the entire screen in that web page. So you can imagine that if we have an event loop and we have event-driven programming and we have lots of events that we have to use callback functions to run, it gets really, really hairy really, really quick. There's this concept called callback hell where you put a callback inside of a callback inside of a callback and it very, very quickly becomes very hard to reason about. There are two primitives that you will surely be using in some way, shape or form when you're writing modern JavaScript. The idea of a promise, which is a way to use the event loop to wait for something to either succeed or fail and then continue where you left off. For instance, if you send a request to a web server, you're waiting for that request to come back. JavaScript is single threaded. You don't want to prevent anything else from running until that response comes back. What you should be doing is saying, hey, runtime, I am done actually executing instructions. I want you to perform this network request. And after the response comes back, then call me up and actually have me run whatever code is supposed to be run after that response has been received. So there's a somewhat hard to wrap your head around, but very important primitive that we see also in Python and a handful of other languages nowadays, this idea of async and await, where we can say rather than writing a bunch of callbacks, writing a bunch of promises, we're simply going to write a function which has a special keyword await, which says implicitly go to sleep, call the next line of this function after that callback has actually been done. So after this fetch to some API.com is done, a callback will happen and run whatever that next line would be in this function. That makes things much, much easier to understand when you're writing asynchronous code, but especially when it breaks, when something wrong happens, it becomes very tricky to debug. 
and it takes a lot of experience to figure out how to make that work correctly. So as we saw earlier, when we were installing that click handler, we were, we were installing that click handler on this document object. So the document object is part of the document object model. When you are in a browser, you have access to a lot of things. You have access to the tree of all the elements that are present on that page. You have access to a lot of APIs that will allow you to say, access the camera, access the accelerometer, make network requests, all sorts of different things that are very, very powerful and available in the web browsing ecosystem. The DOM is available to your JavaScript to use all sorts of these different functions. In this example, we're running a query selector, which is asking the document, hey, search within your tree and find an individual node that has the class named, confusingly, class, and then set the content of that node to hello instead of what was there otherwise. There's a lot of different ways that we're going to interact with the DOM over the course of the class, and that's basically the way that we create web applications where what's shown to the user changes without the user having to load a completely new HTML. There are a lot of modern features in JavaScript like destructuring where you can pull an individual property out of an object so you only have that in your scope without having to deal with object dot name dot first name or whatever have you. You can also use these really, really helpful template literals which allow you to create strings from both your raw text data and variables. There's a handful of other features there. They're useful quality of life additions that make JavaScript just a lot cleaner and easier to understand and easier to write. Strict mode. So in the way, way back, JavaScript was incredibly forgiving of people making mistakes and saying, oh, no, 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 I understand what you were trying to do. I'm going to do something non-standard and actually that could possibly be very dangerous. You can add this use strict string that basically tells the JavaScript interpreter, hey, don't do all of those things where you think you know what's best for me, but it could actually end up getting me into a really sticky situation. This allows you to fail rather than do something unexpected, which is usually what you want when unexpected things are happening. It's usually better to fail and let you know, hey, something is wrong here than to just keep on going merrily and wipe out a database or allow an attacker to steal all your data or whatever have you. So at a high level, when we're running C or we're running C++ or whatever have you, we're just running instructions on a CPU. JavaScript is a little bit different than that. And one of the biggest differences is that sometimes you're running JavaScript on the browser. You have access to the document object model to manipulate what's being shown on screen. Sometimes you're running on a server where there is no concept of a screen. That's not even why it's there. There could be a concept of, say, a file system. So the runtime that you are executing in has a lot of impact on what you're able to do and how you do it. We'll see this a little bit later on when we start talking about server-side JavaScript, but this is definitely something to watch out for. So I'd say those are the most important differences between JavaScript and a lot of the other languages computer scientists learn as they start learning how to code. There's a lot of other differences. One of the other resources that I'm going to shout out here is JavaScript.info that has a really great introduction to these things in a lot more detail. And the best part about it is that it focuses on modern JavaScript rather than giving you all the stuff from the historical era when JavaScript was a lot nastier than it is right now. Good luck learning JavaScript, and I'll see you in the next one.